You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now present the Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome to the Health Hub on Radio Maria Canada, exploring cutting-edge health and wellness information and therapies, helping you to take your health to the next level. I'm your host, Kathy Biasse, and I'm a holistic nutritionist and a professional cancer coach. For women, attention to maintaining hormonal health needs to be addressed not only from month to month, but also from year to year as we transition through the cycles of our life. Our hormone health impacts everything uh, from our blood sugar to our heart health, growth and fertility, our sex drive, metabolism, and our sleep. So navigating the complexities of hormonal health is central to our well-being. Today, my guest is Anita Merchandani, and we are discussing hormonal health and how we navigate the ebb and flow of our hormones to positively impact both our physical and our emotional states. Anita is a registered dietitian and fitness professional. With over 15 years of experience, she specializes in women's health as well as overall general well-being planning. In 2021, Anita launched Arm Nutrition, a nutrition telehealth platform where she works with her clients. On the show, we discuss how women can deal with fluctuating hormones during their monthly cycles, how we can navigate moving through our life cycles, and the impact of circadian rhythm. Please do stay tuned with us. We will be back in just a few minutes to speak with Anita. You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program, The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome back to the Health Hub. Today's show has been recorded. No opportunity for calling in, but please do follow us on our social sites. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we are at the Health Hub RMC on those locations. And give us a follow on all of your podcast platforms. We are the Health Hub, and we would love to what love to have you follow us. We have some amazing, amazing guests. Actually, all of our guests are amazing. They've all brought some valuable information um, to our show. So please do follow us, check out past shows, and, uh, definitely it will be able, we'll be able to keep you up to date with what's happening when you follow us. So, so do hit that follow button. Um, Anita, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, sort of a winded little bit there. I apologize. Sometimes I get caught up in my own head, but that's fine. Um, so let's dive right into this because, what you do and our alignment in our thinking is is quite similar. And I, I just want to make sure that we we really true truly give time and space to what we're going to talk about. And that's the evolution of the understanding of women's health. Now I know you're a nutritionist and you're a trainer. Um tell us how that evolution in your mind took hold. I think, you know, to start with, you know, we are probably going back, you know, centuries and centuries ago to when there were specific roles delineated, you know, for the male and the female, whether it was like the kingdom, the dynasty, the household, you name it. Um, And when you look back and you look at what was delineated for each gender, so to speak, you you kind of look at and you see that, you know, majority of the heavy lifting and the heavy physical activity type, um, you know, sort of responsibilities or the overarching maintenance was always given to the male and, you know, the female, you know, usually got the sort of 
uh, I would say more of like a, a gentle sort of responsibility or managing. And at that time, I mean, it depended on the type of environment, but we're talking about dynasties and kingdoms where, you know, they were overseeing and they were like royalty or they were like, you know, a well enough, you know, to be able to make decisions based on groups of people. So they were not doing so much of the physical activity so to speak, but then we've, we've evolved into managing and people care and communication and things like that. It, I would say that that sort of, you know, is, is one aspect of it when you look back at history. And then the other aspect of it is like the working class of people, the working class of people were those that were hands-on. But the one thing that I was like reading back and I was sort of evaluating across the, you know, the hierarchy of structure was that women's women had cycles. We've always had menstrual cycles. And in our cycles, there was always that, you know, menstruation period, whether it was, you know, two days or six days that we were told by the people above us, by the people who were around us, um, almost making rules for us, that we had to do nothing, that we had to rest or that we, we were not, we were considered not clean, that we were considered, you know, to be taboo, so to speak. Um, and if you think about that at the time, I'm, I'm sure it was very offensive. Like, woe is me? Like, what's wrong? Like, why would you say that? But given the fact that your body is going through something very physiological and physical, you know, it's almost like a blessing in disguise to be told, Hey, take, you know, anywhere from one to six days and do nothing. And while it wasn't presented in a way that was beneficial to us to hear and therapeutic in nature. When we look back at those times, I feel like that's something that, I mean, it's completely forgotten now. And I would love to find a way to almost bring it back into modern day, you know, sort of um, counseling and sort of clinical assessment. Well, you know, there has been a big push to have, um, you know, equality between men and women. Um, I am a big proponent of if you are good enough to do a specific role, male or female, have at it. But I also believe that there are very strong differences between men and women. So in this push to be, uh, this push to equality, we've kind of gotten away from the differences, the real differences between men and women. Um, now, we go through cycles. We also go through stages. But I think what you're, you know, what we're circling on here and what is being pulled forth in, in a lot of the health spaces now is that we need to appreciate these differences. And it's not a lesser than, it's a difference. So women are more susceptible to, you know, we were talking earlier, women are more susceptible to certain inflammation patterns. Women are more susceptible to certain disease, let's say, throughout the different periods of the month. How do you address that in your clinical practice when you are trying to work with women? We'll go through, you know, we have the menstrual cycle that, you know, I'd like to get into and, and how each period of the cycle affects us as women, but also we have stages. Um, how do you present to women in, you, you know, in the, in the arena of nutrition and training um, to work within our monthly cycle? So the way that I probably would approach and every client, so just, you know, I've always put it out there. Nutrition is individualized in terms of what we, you know, provide recommendations, um, you know, sort of the the patterns that we want our clients and patients to follow. And there's no one size fits all. So that's just want to put it out there. Um, the way that I approach it is I look at each client's sort of lifestyle. You know, lifestyle is very important. And that includes, you know, career, that includes domestic familial responsibilities, that includes, you know, sort of health history related, um, if you've got any sort of pre-existing conditions and or have been, you know, diagnosed with something that requires, you know, dedicated medication, consistency of taking it, timing, all of that, 
it includes movement, and it, it includes sleep. All of those are very important, dis, you know, despite the time of the month, despite the phase or transition of life cycle that you're in. But that is all very pertinent. It is a multifaceted approach to every phase and also within the monthly cycle. And I look, I take, you know, all that information that I'm get, I get usually in the first session, I talk to the, the, the patient or the client, we kind of go through all of this and I gather all this data. I ask them to come to the session with as much data as possible from eating patterns, to sleeping patterns, to things that affect their stress, their mood, what is a big challenge in their day-to-day. -day. For example, it could be something as simple as the fact that I have to drop and pick up my children you know, does not allow me to optimize movement in my day-to-day -day lifestyle. So there's various things. We kind of get all of that information and then I kind of come up with what I feel is an appropriate plan. Despite that, I will say that I've always noticed this, that all women are off in their menstrual cycle between days, usually 21 or 22 until day 28. You, in that six day frame, I, I pretty much can say 95% of the time I'm hearing very similar patterns of, I don't feel I'm making bad food choices. I don't feel great. I usually feel very bloated. Sometimes I'm feeling I have migraines. I'm not very motivated. I tend to binge on something that I feel is soothing and, you know, you know, sort of satisfying or craving. I, I'm not sleeping great. I sometimes feel very hot. Sometimes I feel very cold. So my temperatures are very, you know, in flux. Um, I have a short fuse. I'm not as patient. So there's so many of these responses or, you know, from physiological, emotional, mental that I'm hearing in terms of, you know, symptoms or, um, you know, feelings that that need to be addressed and i always like as i as i'm as i'm doing this even talking to you and i'm realizing i'm like how do we tell someone take the week off <laughs> like well yeah you're right you can't you can't do that within you know without our lifestyle but i think certainly educating women on the different levels of hormones as they go through a month and allowing them to understand why they might be experiencing these symptoms might be a revelation to a lot of women, you know, and, and this is the thing that I think I would, you know, I'd really love to focus on now. And as we move forward with, you know, with our practices or with my practice, I think it's important to educate women about how hormones impact health, about how hormones impact mental state, because, you know, back in the day of Mad Men, <laughs> um, you were, if you had fibromyalgia, if you had some of these issues around certain times of the month at all, you were looked at as being psychologically imbalanced. So how do you approach when you're speaking with women, you know, the active phase in the early part of the month, and then you're not feeling so great and the bloated, how do you work nutritionally and how do you work on the information base to educate oh. women? Yeah. So we start off, if we were to start off like a typical month, like a typical 28, anywhere from a 28 to 35 day, you know, sort of range, it's pretty similar in terms of um, how the, the, the systematic hormonal flow goes. We have the follicular phase, which, oh, well, actually, well, let's go back. Let's start with menstruation because menstruation is really day one. So we start with menstruation and we usually have anywhere between three to six days of menstruation. And in this part, your body is really, you know, shedding its uterine lining, you're bleeding. Um, and I focus on the fact that your um, hunger cues and your satiety cues, so the hormones are... Um, leptin and ghrelin are going to be kind of in flux because you're not always feeling, you know, your, your appetite is going to be very, um, it's not going to be fluid. It's not going to be consistent. Um, so I always tell people in the, in these first few days to listen to their body and just eat what makes sense. You want to eat a piece of toast and a tablespoon of peanut butter. Great. You want to eat some cheese and some crackers. Great. You want to not eat anything and just hydrate and like rest or like not rest, but I mean, nobody rests these days, but let's say you're trying to listen to your body and not, you're not feeling like you want to eat anything actually. And you just, maybe you want to hydrate a little bit or you want to have, you know, some sort of, you know, 
the detoxifying hydration beverage of some sort to just help you feel like you're flushing some electrolytes in to give you some energy, fine. But the goal in this first phase is to really put aside what you're, sh what you should do and when you should eat and your usual routine and your typical rhythm and, and really just say, okay, my body's got very interesting hunger and satiety cues. I'm just going to follow that flow. Similarly, cortisol might be an, on its natural sort of elevation or at a higher baseline state, which cortisol is an inflammatory hormone. It's the hormone that basically um, signifies systemic inflammation. It also affects appetite. It also affects insulin activity um, and sort of the, you know, um, one of the results really is, is us retaining abdominal adiposity. So I get a lot of women, you know, this is after years and years of like not assessing this, but it's, it's due to the cortisol levels in our bodies that we just don't know about and, and haven't addressed. So it originates, um, really from, you know, starting from the menstrual cycle. Once we kind of get through menstruation, we go into the follicular phase. And I mean, listen, you talk to anyone, it's like they, it's like day and night when they, their period comes and when it leaves, they feel human again, they have more energy, they feel lighter, their body starts, you know, craving food, you start feeling the hunger, you start feeling the satiety. Um, so that's when I would say, really be strict and go back on your rhythm. And the rhythm that I keep sort of emphasizing on is the circadian rhythm. Our bodies have a natural wake time and sleep time. So they have they wake up on their own and they sort of function in a way that's like, you know, maybe our eyes wake up two hours later. Like, let's say our bodies have started the clock at like between 5 and 6 a.m. Um, but and our eyes might wake up closer to 7 a.m. But really, you know, that's the phase where we want to be structured. So some of the things I emphasize in that are you know, waiting anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes after you wake up and physically get up to let your cortisol sort of naturally warm you up, get your body temperature rising, feeling more alert and limber, um, and then kind of kicking in with the caffeine. A lot of people wake up and start drinking coffee right away. And I'm like, no, it's, you're messing up your circadian rhythm because caffeine, you know, is obviously a stimulant. So you want to sort of wait till the body is kind of waking up and it utilizes stimulant as a collaborator into, you know, getting, getting more alert and getting more stimulated and feeling that refresher. The first thing I would say to do is consume, you know, hydrate a cup, two cups of water, cup with a water, you know, 12 ounces of water with some lemon, um, mint, whatever you want, just hydrate and, and just sort of move, get moving. So in the follicular phase, I would say that the rhythm, the circadian rhythm is the most important. So once you've kind of started the day, nourishing yourself is very important and nourishing yourself in the daytime is very important because your body is awake in the day. It's not awake at 7 PM. It's shutting down in the evening hours. So you want to really nourish your body and nourish it consistently. So breakfast, maybe a midday snack, lunch, maybe a midday snack and dinner all within a circadian rhythm time frame of like, I would say somewhere along the lines of like a 9 a.m. And you sort of wrap up your last meal by like 7, 7.30 p.m. That is the mm -hmm. optimal way of eating. And that is a very cyclical way of eating, especially during the follicular phase when your body has a lot of energy and can capitalize on the nutrients and sort of, you know, feed off of that. This we can make a lot of gains in the in the training space as well during this phase, right? This is where we've yeah. got it all. This is the great phase. Yes. And so in this phase is when you want to focus on complementing your nutrition with your movement. So this is where you will do, you know, you will focus on a little bit more of interval training where you get your heart rate up, you get it down, really, really affecting, um, you know, your oxygen capacity, building more muscle, um, really pushing yourself a little bit harder. And I mean, I wouldn't say go into any, going into any kind of strain mode, but challenging yourself would probably be the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you can capitalize on that. And also with the adequate eating slash movement sinking, you will hopefully see positive effects in your sleep quality, in your sleep pattern. There's a rationale as to why we say eat dinner and give yourself three hours at least to digest before laying horizontal. This is because our bodies naturally get into a resting heart rate that promotes 
effective sleep quality um, and, and, and good REM cycles. And in order for that to happen, we have to eat dinner early. We have to also make sure the dinner design is not heavy, higher in sodium, higher in processed foods. We want dinner really ideally based on, and as I said this, if we were to reflect on you know, the eras and in, in historically what has happened in, in centuries before, dinner is typically sometimes the lightest meal. Why? Because in the dark, you can't always find, you know, the hunt and you kind of have to get, go to what's comfortable and what's quick and what's easy and what's around you. That was back then. Now, if you were to follow the same philosophy of eating during the day and nourishing so that your body is capitalizing on it because the organs are awake and things like that, then dinner would be your lightest meal because that's when your body's starting to sort of shut down. It does shut down. It has its own circadian rhythm where it gets tired. You start seeing that slump anywhere from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And you do not want to put more effort, uh, make the body go through more work and more effort by giving it something heavy to digest and a lot of food all at one time, especially in the evening hours when soon after you're not really moving <clears throat> and expending the energy. So this Fair. is the follicular phase. And when I say this to people, they're like, this makes total sense because I'm around. I have the energy. I can do it. I feel alive again. I'm motivated. So this usually is about two weeks long. And then we get into ovulation, which for some people is, you know, could it is it falls in a four to five day range. And when this happens, that's really the, the peak energy levels. It's just, it's really when you might have your best workouts, you might have your best, you know, sort of schedule and structure. You may not need as much sleep. You, you might find yourself naturally waking up um, or about 30 minutes to 45 minutes, maybe even earlier and like not feeling exhausted and heavy and, and ready to start your day. Um, and in that point, you want to really nourish yourself with, you know, healthy fats, whole grains, like really like high energy and energy dense foods, nuts and seeds and, um, you know, inflammatory boosting foods like salmon, walnuts, leafy greens, things like that. If you don't eat fish, obviously you can go into lentils, lentils and beans. Um, you could do eggs. Eggs are always great at this time too. So these are all like little, little things you can sort of if, if you were to listen to this podcast and be like, what's one thing I can do? Well, I could, I'll consume eggs during this period of time. Like, underrated and so powerful. Um, so that's, I totally agree with that. I'm sorry. I totally agree with that. Eggs, yeah. are, eggs are underrated. And then we hit the luteal phase. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like coming downhill. It's like yeah. the roller coaster. But I if think if women own- understand this and, and I'm going to, you know, we've got a couple minutes before we get into the, uh, get into our break, but if, I, I truly believe if women understand this, they may not think they're losing their minds and they may, may understand the reason. So let's hit the luteal phase before, uh, before we ha- hit the end of our first half. So luteal phase is kind of like, if you've ridden a roller coaster, it's like coming downhill, it comes, you fall, you, you race downhill and you race down fast. Um, you pretty much get into it, you know, within a day or two, it's like ovulation, boom, luteal phase. And this is when you really want to slow down as you come down that roller coaster and you sort of flatten out, you want to slow down, you want to push into and the way that you want to do this is you want to let your body wake up naturally when it does. So this could be for some people, it could be six days, it could be 10 days, everybody's cycle changes, and it's very different. But in this period of time, I've started to explain to women, let your body sleep in, you may only sleep in 15 extra minutes, but that 15 extra minutes can give you a boost of energy, or maybe you won't hit that 3pm or 4pm slump the way that you would if you just push, 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 push. Number one, let your body sleep in. Number two, go with your body's cues in movement. Some You might want to just power walk. You might want to walk and just let yourself walk or do some stretching every day for that entire phase. That is still amazing. Moving, the fact that you're even moving, the fact that you're even in addressing that as, as one of the faceted approaches to your you know lifestyle care is great. So do what you can do. My goal is to keep inflammatory levels low. The best way to do that, the best way to not exacerbate and, and push cortisol up if it's at a baseline higher level is by low intensity, steady state, fat burning exercises, power walking, Pilates, swimming, you know, um, light, just light cardio, deep yoga, stretching yoga in general, um, great ways to sort of address 
cortisol levels, as well as just keeping the blood flow going. So you're not feeling some of those symptoms of achiness, heaviness, you know, maybe potentially some cramping, migraines, things like that. Um, in terms of food, this is, I'll tell you what I would love for you not to do. I would love for you not to eat foods that are higher in sodium and, you know, heavily processed because if you're naturally feeling bloated, you know, you're not going to, and you're already feeling kind of heavy when you eat those foods that are higher in sodium or more processed, um, you're going to feel worse. You're just going to feel, I mean, so to speak, the word gross, like you're just not going to feel great. So that's what I'm telling you not to eat. That means the world's your oyster for food. You want to go ahead and eat, you know, a piece of toast and, um, you know, a slice of cheese in the morning, go nuts. You want to eat some chocolate covered almonds for your morning, mid morning snack. No problem. Your lunch might be some leftovers, but then you might want to have like a yogurt parfait with some chocolate chips on top drizzled with some nut butter and berries, or you might want to have a granola bar. It's fine. Like listen to your body in these cues. If you can avoid the heavy saturated sodium rich processed foods, I think you'll be in a good space. Also, a lot of people have their sensitivities or normal sensitivities to food kick in. So you might find yourself, maybe you might get a rash after eating something. You might find yourself more susceptible to dairy in this phase. So if this is something that is like, you know, light bulbing for you, maybe make notes of it. Maybe track a couple of days, a couple of months of your cycle and sort of say, well, actually, yeah, I'm actually more itchy and X, Y, Z foods affect me and, or I've eaten this dairy and I don't feel great. And it could be only specific to that period, that one week, then you kind of know, okay, now I can avoid these foods too, because it, my body is already kind of inflamed and it's already kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, wired. So let's not, let's not make it worse. Well, I, uh, I think the food journal and I think the cycle journal, they're very, very important. Um, I think it's, I, I think it really does give the story of where you're at and, and helps you to understand where you need to be at. Um, we're going to take a quick break here, but the overarching thing here is that in, you know, when you are going through cycles, the body is, is, this is preparation for pregnancy, right? And, and this is over and over again for how many cycles in a woman's life. Um, and, and this is what your body is, is trying to do. So I think when we appreciate the beautifulness and the wonder that is going on, um, it helps us to understand different flows within our month. And I think it's, it's great that you are working with women to try and not only train them differently in different cycles or in different aspects of their, their monthly cycle, but also giving them an understanding of why their symptomology and also helping them to uh, plan out their food. We're going to take a quick break, everybody. We'll be back in just a few minutes. You are listening to The Health Hub here on Radio Maria Canada, a Catholic voice wherever you are. To contact us and be a part of the show, email thh at radiomaria.ca. We now continue with the program here once again is your host, Kathy Biasi. Welcome back to the Health Hub. So, Anita, we went through uh, a monthly cycle for women, but there are life cycles as well. Um, you know, people there, you know, people over 40, 45 are, are not in the, the menstrual cycle. So, how do you approach training and educating women on transitioning? healthfully into the different life cycles. So I think, you know, feeding off of our conversation on the menstrual cycle, why we even pay attention to it, um, partly because, it, you know, it is the the main data point for fertility. Um, it is, you know, it kind of what enables a, a person, a female to, to get pregnant. And so when we talk about the life cycles, we talk about the fertility era. And one thing to note, is that maybe back in the day, the fertility era was, you know, for young women anywhere in the early 20s to, you know, it, you know, I would say in the 50s, it was like if you were pregnant after 30, you know, that was considered old. Um, but we're moving into a more modern era where people are, are now prioritizing um, 
their their life. What is it they want to do with their life, whether it's career or finding that greater purpose and then moving into having possibly not meeting who they want to settle down with as a partner and or moving into um, having the fertility phase much later in their age. That being said, um, there is something very, very important to address here with with age and, and hormones. If you are younger, um, you know, I would say the main things to address are finding that cyclical balance, not necessarily within the menstrual cycle, but within your life. It is equally as important if you are younger. Some people say, oh, well, I'm young. I have more energy. I don't have to worry about sleep so much. I don't have to worry about, um, you know, my body. I can eat whatever I want. I, you know, if I don't work out for a few days, it's no big deal. Sure. Maybe that's a bit true for each person. It's different, but I will say this, the sooner you can kind of figure out what that 80, 20 balance is. And when I say 80, 20, I mean, 80% of the time you're doing what you, what your body feels or what your body needs is optimal. And 20% of the time you're living your life. And in that 20% of the time you are socializing, you may deviate from the norm, you may be traveling, you might have obligations that don't allow you to be on, you know, on your best behavior, so to speak. Um, but 80% of the time you're really living that optimal lifestyle. It, it, it just never hurts. There's no data that says you can't start early in optimizing your routine. Um, and that is sleep care, that is, you know, movement, that is food, um, eating nourishing foods and, and finding that balance between your, you know, day life and your night life. And, and those and, are, those are good things to set into place, but they do change, don't they? As we move, like they you do have change. to keep addressing and tweaking. And as we go through all periods of our life, so when you move into, let's say from fertility, you move into pregnancy, eventually you do get pregnant uh, if you choose to, and or you choose to go whatever path it is that you end up getting into that, that lifestyle, life cycle change, whether it's actually physically going through pregnancy or then going into postpartum or then becoming a mother. It's kind of all jumbled together. Um, those phases, I think the biggest thing that we see um, are the stress hormones go up and the sleep and sleep related hormones start becoming affected. And the biggest thing that the biggest sort of implication of this physiological effect is weight gain. Um, not only do we see weight gain, we see hair loss, we see um, possibly skin, you know, rashes or, or an increased amount of acne or, you know, blemishes. Um, we see more tired eyes and wrinkles um, on the face, uh, our bodies, we, we might see, you know, dry skin peeling could be, you know, just lack of nourishment. So there's a lot of uh, sort of associations that come up when this sort of period gets into play. Um, it's hard to tell any of these women in any of these because it's all jumbled together. Oh, you know, you really need to take care of yourself. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, duh. I know I need to take care of myself. Um, and so it's really kind of finding a few points that I can give them that they can at least hone in on. And those three points I usually address are don't wait till your kids sleep to have dinner. I don't care if you're eating a slice of pizza. If it's if it's, if it's available and it's food and it can fill you up, and even if it's not the optimal healthy design of like a beautiful sheet pan of protein and vegetables, if you're eating at 5 or 5.30 with your kids and you're nourishing yourself to, to eat, just to not wait till like 8 o'clock, do it. Because that is healthier than not eating eating some of the scraps of your kids' food, putting them to bed, maybe snacking a little more, then making your dinner and then sitting down and eating at 8.30. Fair. It's just, it's going to affect your sleep. It's going to affect your health in terms of, you know, hormone regulation and weight gain eventually. So my first thing is always, I always tell people, I'm like, what's the lesser of two evils? Eating early. Always, whatever you can do, eat early. It doesn't matter. If you feel like you need a little snack later, we'll address that too. But really try your best to eat early and don't stress about what it is that you're eating. If if you can get your hands on, like, because I always tell people, I'm like, if you can get your hands on a slice of pizza, and maybe you've got a bag of greens or some roasted veggies sitting in the refrigerator, put that together. Boom, done. Like, it doesn't have to be super creative or it doesn't have to be 
the, the more people, most of these women, most of us, we want to do our best all the time. We want to, uh, if we're, if it's, it's either like we have a good day and the day is super good in every which way, or it's a bad day. That's not true. You can have a normal day, a normal good day and still eat the pizza and still have the vegetables. It doesn't mean it constitutes as a bad eating day. So I, I like people to, I like my clients and patients to be aware of that. Like it's the decisions that you're making because some of those decisions will impact further decisions related to your health. Do you, do you think that um, if women knew this as they were pregnant, that there will be hormonal changes, that there will be uh, bodily reactions after you've had the baby? I don't, I don't know if you have, it, it might just be an observational um, answer to the question, but do you think that a fair amount of postpartum depression could be avoided if women went into, um, into their pregnancy and then came out of it with a plan? A plan that is also with low expectations of recovery. Okay, I have a ton of clients... Actually, I could probably even talk to it a little bit about myself where, you know, I don't know who and when it all originated that if you nurse and you're breastfeeding, you're going to drop all the weight. Well, no, actually, breastfeeding, producing milk is a thermogenesis effect. And for most women, we retain fat. And actually, we have we get hungry because we are, we're producing the milk and then we eat the milk, but we're not losing the weight because we have to produce the milk and our body needs the thermogenesis, the fat. It's almost like this cushion. Think about like a mama bear. Um, and so they all go through this phase where they're like, I'm nursing, I'm raising my child, my child is growing. Hopefully that everything is growing well and going in the right direction, but I don't like how I look in the mirror. I don't like the fact that I haven't dropped the weight. I don't like that I everything feels less firm. And this is not for every single person, but a majority of the people do feel this type of stuff, you know, sort of physical, just physical discomfort in, in how they look and, and, and their strength in general. So if you go into it with like, all right, let's get a year plan. It's not a six month plan. It's not even the fourth trimester. It is one full year after you give birth, you have to be at grace with yourself because you might nurse and usually let's say you, anyone can stop nursing at any given time. Then you got to give yourself a good three months after you stop nursing for your body to then kind of get back into a, oh, I'm not in a pregnant lactating state anymore. Then it takes time to get to that, that new hormonal reset. And then from there you go into like, you know, a more normalcy of hormones and then blood work and blood parameters from, you know, glucose levels and cholesterol levels and things like that. So you got to give yourself a full year for almost every kid that you have. Are you willing to understand this? And are you willing to commit to this? And do you know that this could be, you know, something that you will have to deal with every time? Yes. If you can sort of wrap your head around that, I think. I think the pressure will sort of just, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you don't different. have to have the baby and lose the weight within three, within it's three not, months. It's, it could be, it could be anything from like my skin, look at my eyes, look at my skin, my hair. Like, why do I feel like I feel saggy in my triceps or like, why do I have knee pain? Cause I have this extra weight gain. Like it could be anything really. Mm -hmm. And if, as women are having, you know, their, peri uh, their pregnancies later, they're noticing a transition between postpartum feelings, which is this one year, as I said, to commit to understanding that this is how long your body might take to normalize into perimenopause. Like if women are having their kids in their late thirties, you know, sometimes even forties, and then they're going into perimenopause. Now they're just like completely uncomfortable mm -hmm. because they've got a whole slew of symptoms that are irrespective to the postpartum world thrown into their mix. So would you say that there then are four basic life cycles or are you three? Yeah, I guess we could start with like the men's. So, you know, you, be, you start menstruating, you know, it's a young adult, young women, and uh, you go into fertility, young in that pretty much, obviously the menstruation signals like, you know, you can be fertile. Right. So then we have the fertility phase, which is fluid. Um, and it could be many, many decades for some people. Um, pregnancy postpartum and then perimenopause and then into menopause. Yeah. 
The phase yeah. between postpartum and perimenopause, I don't know if it can really be defined because mm-hmm. I mean, it's because I would say the hormones probably confuse the crap out of most of us. So <laughs> it is not really defined. I, I, you know, I think just talking about this and having conversations around this, if we can get women to understand that the body is going to change and we need different things for different adaptations, but there's a conversation. I think that's the most important thing that there's a conversation about this, that we do truly identify that we are different from men and that, you know, for us, for women, it may be, you know, readjusting a lot more frequently than men have to readjust. And I think that that, you know, the more we can talk about that and the more we can feel comfortable, um, the better we are in our own headspace. So that that connection between the physical and the mental. Now, when well, we get- also, yeah, I just ahead. want to say one thing based on what you said. When you are taking note of this conversation, I think it's also apparent to say that if you feel it, address it. If you feel it, write it down. It's a data point. The more you start addressing and accepting that X, Y, Z is happening and you write it down and you start paying attention, the more you can kind of figure out, well, okay, this is, this is a situation. This is what I'm dealing with at this point. And how do I make myself feel better with all of these things present? And I think that's the problem because we tend to ignore it or we tend to put it off or we tend to think that, you know, it's not normal. And that might cause us more anxiety and more stress, but in actuality, accepting it is part of the the process. Well, I mean, there's the physiological and the mental stuff as we progress through life. And then there's also that whole other arena of the mental stuff that we're putting on ourselves Mm -hmm. to be that perfect mother, to make sure that, that everything is perfect within the household, running different schedules, You know, I think the word you used was grace. And I think, I think if we look at another woman and identify them and what they're going through and we can give them grace, we should be able to turn that back on ourselves and give us grace. We don't all go through the same life cycles. We don't all have babies, but we all have a commonality that I think women I don't think women look upon themselves as much as they should and say, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm doing okay. And there's no standard that I have to live by. That's a tough thing to do in this time. A tough, oh, tough thing yes. to do. At every transition, um, I think that's important because you're always looking at the next friend or, mm-hmm. or you know. And the Instagram life. Yeah. And it can, it can really throw can throw a lot of people for a loop. And and this conversation is so important because you know, on one on one aspect of your hormonal balancing, you look at something fine. Another day you look at something and it sets you off. But again, I think that the fact that you are coming out and you are you're identifying women as a species that needs to be different dealt differently than with men within their training, within their nutrition and within their life cycles is truly moving forward in the space that I like to see moving forward. I think what you're doing is wonderful. Wonderful. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I think it's like I said to you, it's a work in progress. It is something that, you know, as in probably the last, I would say five years, um, more and more global attention has been placed on women's health, maternal women's Mm -hmm. health um, and outcomes. I think that a majority of us will start having these conversations at various points um, of when our life is affected. Um, and that's a start. So at least if that's my homework to you, uh, all who are listening, I would say that, you know, start having those conversations and asking your health professionals or seeking out even someone like me, like a dietitian who can help you really understand the multifaceted approach to what it is to have that kind of lifestyle that what is healthy and what is, what is healthy for you? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't get a chance to touch upon it though, but there are so many diseases, um, uh, diseases that women experience that um, symptomology is impacted by different stages of their, of their menstrual cycle. Um, Lupus is one of them, Uh, you know, and it's important for for women to start focusing and looking at themselves as this multi-layered 
species um, that, you know, men don't have the hormone fluctuations and the different hormones that we do. So the more we can appreciate that and the more we can, as you say, take notes, write down, you know, if you see a flare up, if you're a lupus um, sufferer, you see a flare up at certain times of the month pay attention to that. Maybe you can get a hold of some of those things. So, you know, it's, it goes beyond Anita, just, you know, eating and getting through and training. Well, what you're doing in this awareness and pushing for the different understandings of how hormones and cycles impact women, you're also, um, and this could be a whole different show. You're also opening the door for women to navigate certain illnesses. Yes. And that's absolutely. many different illnesses. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that can't be a conversation for this show. But if people want to, to reach out to you to, um, you know, start a conversation, where would they look? Um, my website is just my first name and last name dot com, Anita Merchandani.com. I'm also on Instagram. My handle is fit nut, like I'm a fit nut, F-I-T-N-U-T, Anita. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time and being uh, with us today. I love the conversation. I love the way um, you're headed. And and I, I truly hope that so many other practitioners follow your lead. I super appreciate it as well. And I, I loved connecting with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, Anita. And everybody, we'll talk to you next week on The Health Hub. have been listening to The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Here 